teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Join us in worship this morning.
more facts and ideas, not to have things to talk about, is not to come and see our friends and to pause in a busy schedule and just kind of reflect. It is to know you more. That's why we're here. So saturate us with your presence. Fill, fill us with an awareness of you. Let us see Jesus today. In his name we pray. Oh, one more thing. Thank you. Good morning. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm 11, verses 1 through 7. If you're following along in the Pew Bible, that will be on page 387. Psalm 
Psalm 11, verses 1 through 7. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows upright in the heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Upright men will see his face. Our New Testament reading this morning has come from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. And in the Pew Bible, that's on page 847. Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 16. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one that has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. May God bless the reading of his word this week. There were so many places we could have taken scripture from to be able to start this this new series. I really have no idea how long this is going to last, at least 10 more weeks. Because we're going to look at five different segments of how we live, how we are designed through our emotions and through our motivations over the next uh, couple of months. And we may find that there is enough depth to be able to examine that in a kind of another round. I have some ideas about what we'll do, but we'll cover that when we get there. I'm calling the entire series Thoroughly Human by God's Design. What's interesting is the link between our existence, our experience of ourselves, of our world, of our life, is, of course, thoroughly human. We are human beings. The question is, how do we link to God in that? What does it mean that God has made us in his image? In Genesis chapter 1, the very first phrase of the scripture is, in the beginning. It's interesting for us because we usually, in the Western world, take that as an expression at the beginning of time. Go back to moment zero. In the theory of the Big Bang, it is what happened prior to the billionth of a second when everything began to flee out. What happened then, in the beginning? What started it all? The trouble with that is the Hebrew expression that's used there is uh, is not a time-based expression. If we were to tell a fable or a fairy tale, We might say to a child, once upon a time, and if a child looked at the watch or a clock and said, what time? What time was that? Well, it's like 1147 AD, I think a Monday in the... That's not what once upon a time means. Once upon a time means, here's how we're going to start the story. Let's begin somewhere. In the beginning is a Hebrew expression that is not linked to time, it's related to the story itself. And when the writer of the book of Genesis, in the person of Moses, says, in the beginning, the first word to begin is God. It's not a a history of, of timing. It's the reflection 
and inspiration of God. In the beginning, by way of beginning the story, as we unfold our experience and God's way of seeing the world, what happened? God. God created the heavens and the earth. That's where the story begins. It is in God's creation. In verse 26 of chapter 1, after the realms of creation have been established and the realms have been populated by God's speaking, his, his word created everything. God said, let there be light. God said, let the waters be separated from the heaven. God said, let fish populate the waters and stars and planets and suns and moons populate the heavens. Let four-footed animals and creeping animals and those which crawl upon the ground populate the land. And God said, let us make man in our image. Use the plural. Probably that is an emphasis. It's not a reflection of the Trinity. It is the way Hebrew could underscore. They could, it could make bold. It could create emphasis. This is God himself. The climax of his creative power is to create mankind. The Hebrew word for mankind is Adam. That also happened to be stuck as Adam's first name. But the word is simply an untranslated Hebrew word that means humankind. And Genesis is very careful to emphasize repeatedly the design factor. How God created his entire world, climaxing in the creation of mankind. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And he uses two different expressions. Is that two different qualities of God? He has an image, and he also has a likeness. A reality of Hebrew poetry, in fact, the language itself, is to make a statement and to use similar or identical words to, to create underscore, to italicize. So when the phrase is used, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. It, it is, did you get that? We are unlike any other aspect of creation. This is a climax for God. This is the way in which he sees himself within the creation by his word. We were made in his image, in his likeness. And then God gave the reason why we were created in his image. So that they may rule over the creation, over the fish of the sea, over the animals of the land, over the soil itself, over all that has been. The word for rule there is a fascinating Hebrew word. We often take that to mean to dominate, to be in power, to set the rules, to be able to utilize everything, to abuse if we wish or use when we want or dispose of as we please. That is not what rule means. The word that's used there means to nourish, to, to bring into its fullness, to cause to, to flourish. If you were to take a weed field segment of your backyard and rule it, you would take it from its chaos and create beautiful plants or nourishing vegetables. You would make that plot of gra ground become everything it could possibly be. And the Hebrew word for that is to rule over that land. When God says, we are going to make man in our image, in our likeness, so that he can rule over the earth. Fascinating statement, because that's what God does. He causes it to flourish. His goal is not to abuse or to use or dispose of as he pleases. It is to cause all things under his care to be sustained and to grow and to live and to be all that it can possibly be. So that mankind is given the same task that is God's task, just in part, where his is in whole. The scripture goes on in chapter 1. So God created mankind, Adam, 
in his own image, in his likeness. And then the phrase is made again, in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. We tend to add punctuation. Hebrew doesn't have punctuation. For that matter, Hebrew doesn't have vowels. It only has consonants. The original documents, the ancient copies of Scripture, have no spaces between the words. That's really hard to read. If you take any story, even one that you know very well, take all the vowels out, take all the spaces between the words, and all you have is consonants all the way across. How in the world could you possibly understand what that means? The story gets told from those who know to those who don't. And is told over and over carefully, repeated so that the truth is revealed. In Hebrew, this becomes a shouting, an exclamation. It is a proclamation. It is an announcement. It's not a history. It links who we are to who God is. In the image of God, God created them, male and female, he created them. How more sure? Can anything be communicated than our human identity, our existence, thoroughly, is not only by the divine design, it's in the divine design. We are in his image. So, what is then the divine design? In Genesis chapter 1 through 3, those three chapters, at the beginning of the interaction, the relationship, even the breaking of that relationship between Adam and Eve and God, not any other animal, not the stars, not the planets, not the minerals, not the structures of the universe, but a personal being with an identity, a memory, and awareness. The ability to make moral choices. Mankind is in relationship with God. There are all manner of perceptions that are made. What that they see, what they hear, what they, they touch, what they feel, what they experience. We'll mention, although this is not going to be a seminar on psychology over the next 10 weeks, the way in which we engage our world, ourselves, within, and everything that is without, is through the means of our perception. We're going to find not only is that carefully revealed about every person in Scripture, it is also revealed about Jesus as a thorough human being. And it is also used to reflect the nature of God, the person of God, how he interacts. He hears, he sees, he touches, he feels. So we'll see the link between who God is and who we are, and in fact, God in flesh, who Jesus is. See, one of the things that's real about the way in which we perceive Jesus often is we, he's really kind of a pretend man. He's not really a thorough man. He's a pretend man. Kind of plastic. When he walked on the ground, his feet didn't really get dirty. He never got a hangnail. He was never really upset. He never got tired. He kind of floated through life, and he, and he did everything flawlessly and perfectly. That's not what Scripture says. It says he was tempted or tested he was pulled, he was pushed, he was jammed, he was enticed, he was crushed, he was hurt, he was angry in every way as we are, but without sin. Now what's fascinating is we re look at the story and record of Jesus himself, we will find that every human emotion we feel, everything, he felt too clearly identified in Scripture. As a matter of fact, one of the difficulties we have in our English translations is we tend to soften certain verses to make them a little bit more palatable to the Western American reading. We like it to sound a little bit nicer. But the original languages are very, very clear. Everything you feel, he felt. The ways in which you struggle, the ways in which you triumph. The delights you have and the struggles that you have, the challenges that you face, he felt. But not with sin. 
So is getting angry by itself wrong to do? Jesus wouldn't get angry, but he did. When you're tired and crabby and snappy, Jesus never got tired and crabby, but he did, yet without sin. So we're going to look at that over the next number of weeks. Out of the perceptions, there were responses to those perceptions. Not only do human beings have those responses, but we're going to find that God has those responses as well. The basis of my work and what I do in terms of living my own life and engaging many others is on the five basic emotional systems, and we're going to look at the five systems, but creatively. This will not be a seminar. You will not take notes for that purpose. It is designed to get, give you a, a scriptural, thorough understanding of how God has made you in his image. How you understand yourself. What does that mean? And how you understand others and respond in those situations. So, so there are five main systems. We see Adam and Eve engaging them in the very first chapters of the scripture. And then men and women, children and adults, the elderly, the weak, the strong, the kings, the paupers, experiencing those emotions as a result of their perception. Sometimes, even in scripture, people see things wrongly. And they react to that wrong image. That has to be corrected later on. We find that all the time. We also find that God has the same five kinds of responses. It's written in scripture, and we tend to gloss over it even when we read. But they're clearly there. Out of the five, system, the five responses come different drives and motivations, our choices, our decisions. We mull them over. Sometimes they're automatic, and sometimes they're very carefully thought through. There are times in Scripture which are really going to create huge challenges to our understanding. When God has a plan, and then he says, I'm not going to do that plan. The, the factors have changed. And my awareness of what's going on is now different. And so I'm going to undo what I planned, and I'm going to plan something else. What? How can God do that? We're going to examine that. Then come behaviors that come out of those decisions, which are countless positives and negatives. And by positive and negatives, I don't mean good things to do and bad things to do. But the way in which you perceive the world and make choices will result in things you actively do or actions you suspend, what, what you prevent yourself from doing. You have a perception of something going on in your family. Your brain says, blurt out this. Here, here's what you say right now. The words, and you say, oh, that sounds just like my mother. And so your, your action is a negative action. I'm not, not going to say that. And the silence is a decision and an act. But from everybody else's perception, it's nothing happened. But there was clearly something happened. So we're going to look at both the positives and the negatives of our behavior. So what are the good ones and what are the bad ones? How do we understand who we are and how we live? My philosophy is there are no good or bad emotions at all. It is not bad to be angry or depressed or sad. It is not good to be happy or to be loving automatically. It's much more complicated than simply saying that feeling is good, that feeling is bad. And the reason why I say that is that God himself expresses of himself all of the range of emotions the decisions, and then the actions. If, if it was automatically sinful, God could not do it. He would not. But we're going to find in Scripture that's not true. God, godly men and women would never struggle. They would never experience those things. They're just too good for that. We're going to find out that's not true. What it means is then we have the possibility of taking full ownership of God's perfect design in us, flawed to be sure, temporary and partial, I understand that clearly, mortal, ending in death. That's real. 
but that the divine design is still within us, even while we are thoroughly human. In Genesis 1.31, it says that God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good, all that he had made. He saw Adam and Eve having emotions of fear, of anger, confusion. That they only knew in part, and then they were in some ways ignorant. He saw everything that he had made that was very good. It wasn't partly good. It was very good. So when he looks at you, he recognizes what he designed in you is good, is very good. Often what happens is that the struggle is we condemn ourselves for the wrong reasons. Not for the things that break relationship, but for the things that make us thoroughly human. So embracing them and understanding why did God give us that full range? Why didn't he just make us float along through life without fear, without anxiety, without rage? Why do we have to have those things? Because that's his divine design. That is his image in us. We're going to look at that. The five emotion systems that we're going to look at, well, let me give you two other verses. First Samuel 16 and 7. A prophet has gone to select a new king for Israel. And Eli's family gathers all of his sons together. One of them, Eliab, is a massive individual. Firstborn son, strong, capable, intelligent, owner of everything, and the prophet says, here it is. Here's the man. I am looking at God's anointed. And God sticks his nose in there and says, nope, you're not. You look on the outward. I examine the heart. I look at what makes this man who he is. And it's David that I picked. The runt, the squirt, the little kid out taking care of the sheep. He's the one I picked, not the majestic, strong, capable-looking son. You look at the outward, but God looks at the inward. In Hebrews chapter 12, uh, 4, the verse that we read, it's often translated in our English Bibles as a third person in it. The word of God, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates between the marrow and the joints, the thoughts and intents of the heart. But when John wrote his gospel, going back to the book of Genesis, the word of God is a person, not a thing. The word of God doesn't refer to the Bible or the expressions of God, but to Jesus himself. And it may very well be that the writer of the Hebrews' letter is not thinking of scripture on pages printed, but the person of Jesus himself. The word of God, he is alive and active. He is sharper than any double-edged sword. He penetrates the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. He judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare. Therefore, we have confidence when we come to the throne of God. Because we have a Savior who has been tempted in all ways as we are. The word of God is a person. And that's what gives us confidence in coming to God through our Savior. The five systems we're going to look at are the system of acceptance. What does it mean to love something? Can love be directed wrongly? Is it unhealthy? Does it bring us to God or drive us from God? Those things with which we accept that which we draw into our lives, that which we yearn for or long for or are dependent upon. We're going to look at the entire concept of acceptance and how love and desire work, how it was designed and how it becomes broken. The second one is exposure, fear, anxiety, guilt, shame. Are they there for a reason? Do children who steal cookies before dinner Exhibit guilt as a value? Is, is that positive in their lives? Or is that just something to be put away? 
We're going to look at the way God designed all of those feelings of exposure and why they work the way they work. What happens when they become broken or damaged or twisted? The third one, I call empowerment. It's a struggle with the word, and I went a long, long time trying to find the right word. It has to do with anger and frustration and competitiveness and drive and determination, rage. All the things that have to do with, with the way in which we engage our world and struggle to change it or change ourselves or change others. To force our will. Is that a bad thing? Or is it in fact godly? But it has become twisted and damaged in us. We're going to look at that. The fourth one I call depletion. Sadness, loss, grief, emptiness. Being overwhelmed, being drained, being de depleted. Having nothing on which to go. Is that a, a bad feeling? Sometimes I'll say to a person, how are you feeling today? They say, I feel bad. Why do you feel bad? I'm so depressed. So you feel good. That's a good feeling. They have no, it's not. You're a stupid pastor if you think that. No, really. God has given you that for a reason. Let's find out what the reason is. Getting a splinter in your finger that becomes infected hurts. That's good. We don't have to look over your entire body to find the source of the infection. We know right where to go, where it hurts. The pain is there for a purpose. Let's find out what that purpose is. And God gave it to you for a reason. The last one I call, call celebration, which is joy and happiness. The effusing of life, ecstasy. Is that always good? Is it always? Is the goal of life to be happy? Is that its purpose? Or can happiness itself drive you from God and become, in fact, a destruction to you? So we're going to look at these five different systems over the next few weeks and examine it not through theoretical teachings, but real men and women found in Scripture, and every one of them through the life of Jesus and the presence of God and the way he works in our lives. Thoroughly human, thoroughly Jesus was, by divine design, so are you. That's not a bad thing. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your word has so much for us. It's not just history or pithy sta statements that we can turn into bumper stickers or put up on our walls. Memory verses that help us get through a day by focusing on a new kind of Christian mantra that get us through a tough time. This really is truth. This, this is who you are, who we are how you have made us, what your design is, why you did what you did, and why you do what you do. But aside from all the ideas and thoughts, from our first song, we want to know you. We want to know you. Not just know about you, facts and details and theology and truth and doctrine. We don't want to have all that nailed down right, still not know you as we are known. The cry of our hearts, let us know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, before we get to our, our worship music today, uh, um, <clears throat> I don't know why I'm choking up. I'm not, not really sure. <clears throat> God, I woke me up at like 3.30 this morning. Um, I need to just, uh, <clears throat> my gosh, why is this happening? <laughs> You're a hoax. Uh, um, the last couple of weeks I came to church and I was just like grumpy and um, I'm up here and I'm playing and um, just, just going along with it but you know I wasn't singing words I wasn't really getting into it <clears throat> my God. and um, so he, he put on my heart this morning to, to, to talk about that just, just for a minute um, to you know if you come in like that <clears throat> just um, just to leave it at the door Leave it outside. Come in here fresh. Come in here willing to listen. Um, to just give him a little crack, and he can open it up. Um, let him in. Let him take the, the bad stuff out. <clears throat> um, just give him that opportunity, like I, I didn't do the last couple weeks. So let's take take this time and let's worship together.
Sundays, we, we take time <clears throat> after church to, uh, for those of us who uh, stay for uh, not about another hour, go downstairs around the fellowship hall, and we used to have one table, now we're up to almost four tables, of uh, people who gather and we share requests and we hear them throughout the congregation, list them, we send out a prayer list every Sunday afternoon, Paula does that, and we spend a concerted amount of time in prayer because we have to be done here by 9.30 for the Methodist Church to come in. This is really their building, and, uh, and so we are here as their guests. So we're pretty careful about trying to get out at 9.30, 1, 2, somewhere in there. Pretty close. 
Uh, today is our annual meeting for the budget, which sounds really thrilling and boring. Like we're gonna take all your money and not give you anything back. That's not really entirely true. We are gonna take all your money, but we're gonna give a lot back. Uh, we're going to be looking at the 2014 budget. We have a couple of uh, changes that, that we've uh, brought in that really build ministry, a lot that goes uh, back to all of our families and to uh, what we do. And look uh, at the financial plan for getting the loan that will allow us to do construction this spring and then this summer. So we have some, some serious things to talk about. To look at that, um, please bring all of your wealth, uh, the title to your cars and your homes, and then we'll give back to you what we don't need. No, not really. We're not that kind of church. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you're new here, relatively new here, you'll notice we don't take offerings anymore. Uh, and that is, if you're a guest here, you really, we don't even want to suggest, you really have an obligation to somehow help make this all possible. The members of this church and the people who are committed to it are the ones who, by their choice, uh, either go through the offering bowls at the back of the sanctuary or through PayPal or a wide variety of ways. That it is worship. It is clearly worship. It is personal worship. It's a way in which we commit ourselves to God. But we don't take time as a function of our community together to dedicate into passing plates and all that that goes on. We understand what goes on. So what we do is we have an entirely different means, and today's meaning is extremely important for us to look towards 2014. Uh, we do take time for prayer. We want the focus of all that we do, not just me as pastor praying for the congregation, but for all of us through our songs, through hearing his word, through responding to that word, to be able to clearly hear with God and to communicate with God our hearts and our presence. Our prayer song today is Times of Refreshing. It is conventional, conventional for us to be tired. There are so many things going on, and we race from one thing to the next without enough time to prepare or to reflect. We feel unrefreshed. Our time of prayer is not really to give us a new frame of reference or to make our bodies feel better or like we had a good, satisfying meal, but that down at the root of it all, in our soul, that's where when we are unrefreshed, trouble begins. It is in his presence we have times of refreshing. We'll pray together, close our service, go to our meeting. Be refreshed in the presence of God. greater joy than being with you. We don't really know how to do that. It's, it's like we, we ought to go off on a retreat someplace distant and commune with nature. We should get up real early when everything's quiet and the phone hasn't started ringing and the tele television is on. That's when we can really focus and commune with you. But what you desire is that, that 
going from mm. appointment to appointment, fixing dinner, cleaning up messes, dealing with our children, struggling with the realities of life, <clears throat> that there we are refreshed with you. We get lost in the detail. But you are the big picture. And so we want to come to you and find the satisfaction of our soul. The hungering in us, the emptiness that is there. Not satisfiable by any object or part of creation, but only by the creator. And that is how you made us. To hunger and thirst for you. So as we are racing from place to place, like John said, sometimes we've got to dump a load and then find our refreshment in worshiping you. So refresh us. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our promise for you today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 6. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh.
Let's read together our benediction from Psalm 72. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And have a great week this week.